When you run an online class or seminar or workshop, often the thing that's missing is that sense of collaboration. Participants working with one another, contributing to small group discussions, writing stuff on post-its or flip chart paper, and then using that to contribute to a large group discussion. But there are a number of collaborative online tools that you can use to replicate that dynamic collaborative experience online. In my own teaching, I've had particular success at using virtual whiteboards and in particular a platform called Miro, which facilitates that collaborative sharing of ideas in my online seminars. And in this video, I'm going to show you how you can use it too. In essence, a virtual whiteboard is a space you can direct participants to to complete activities relevant to the session. Participants can add thoughts on post-it notes, move them around, move objects around, and add pictures to contribute to the topic or focus of the session. I'm going to show you some different templates and formats that I've been using, as well as how I actually use it in a virtual seminar itself. But first, a little bit about the Miro platform. Anyone can sign up for a free Miro account. This will give you three boards to have a play around with. But the great news is that if you're an educator or a student, you can upgrade to a free education account. All you have to do is provide your education email, some evidence of your role at the institution and some accreditation of your institution. And once this is approved, you'll get a bunch of extra features, which you're definitely going to want to use if you end up using this platform in your own teaching and facilitation. So when you're ready to start exploring, the first thing to do is to set up a board for you to experiment around with. So you have a bunch of templates that you can use, but the first thing you'll want to do is just explore the platform itself. The way to organize content on your board is through frames. Third from the bottom is the frame tool. And I tend to organize all my content on 16 by nine frames, but you can do this however you like. Then once you've got your frame, you can start experimenting with some content. So you can add shapes and you have some tools for formatting these. You can add text, add sticky notes, and you have various other tools on your left hand side here. I'll show you a few more of those in a moment, but it's worth just having a little play around so that you can get used to the interface and the way things work. You can also add extra frames here if you want to start building something a bit more substantial. Once you start building content for a session itself, sometimes it's helpful to start using and adapting the templates that Miro provides. One of my favorite activities is using the icebreaker tool. This gives you a template where each participant has an area of the board and you can add as many boxes as there are people in your session by copying and pasting the template. I use my Mac shortcuts command C, command V, so that you can easily replicate the content. In this activity, I ask participants to provide an image that represents them and something they learned from the lecture that they watched before the seminar. If I know who's going to be attending this seminar beforehand, I will pre-populate each box with the person's name so that when they navigate to the board, they can find their name and start their activity. I also put their full name on the board and then they can edit it if they like to be known by a different name or a shortening or a nickname. To add an image to the board, I tell participants you can click on the three dots at the bottom of the toolbar and do a Google image search, or you can upload an image you have on your own machine, or you can literally drag something into the window. 
This is such a great activity because everybody has a section of the board that is theirs. So I can see who's engaging and who's not. And then when we come back as a group, I give time for each participant to respond to what they did. So they can turn their mic on or just respond to me in chat, talk to me about the picture they provided, talk to me about what they learned. So this is a great organic way of having an organic discussion about the topic material. And if this activity is going well, we're having a good discussion, then I'll often let this activity take the whole seminar. You can see in this session, people added loads of content, loads of thoughts. Only a couple of people didn't engage. And this can lead to a discussion about relevant things. So in this seminar, it led to a discussion about the panopticon gamification and then I can add text and image to illustrate this around the board. Another great use case is group work. So in this board, which was for a module about identities in psychology, we asked participants to add post-it notes about important aspects of their identity and unusual aspects of their identity. We put people into six breakout groups. They then navigated to the relevant section according to their group. And then each group could feedback about the discussion that they had. Another great thing that can happen in these activities is people start to make links between different aspects and people will start to organize things in interesting different ways. So this was a board that my colleague used where she asked participants to organize these categories. And then you can see participants started color coding, using interesting shapes, organizing things in different ways. You can also see on this board where I asked students to identify an example of healthism. Participants were often really creative in incorporating a visual language alongside the post-its that they added. So it builds in a flexibility that can be really beneficial in an online seminar environment. On this board about online deviance, I adapted the dot voting template. So people could rank these different scenarios from their most anonymous to their least anonymous. And I color graded these dots as well. So once participants were done, it created this really interesting heat map of these different scenarios. So a couple of tips when you're creating these boards. You can lock items into place. This is particularly helpful for items you don't want participants to be moving around. So if you click on an object or group of objects, you can just click the padlock and this will lock this into place. Just make sure if there's any post-it notes or fields you want participants to be able to edit, like their name, that you set these as unlocked. Also, for more complex boards, you can make links between different parts of your board. So on this board, I made a link to each group's board so they could navigate there easily. And on this board, people could toggle between the questions and the images that I wanted them to comment on. The way you do this is you make your text that you want to be your linking object, hit the three little dots, and then you can link to any other part of the board. Another top tip is once you've made your board, you can duplicate it. So if you're running the same seminar multiple times, you can make as many copies as you need. Do make sure you've finished editing the board though, because sometimes I want to make more changes. And then when you're making those changes, they only apply to that board that you're editing, which means you have to duplicate it again. It's not the end of the world, but it can be a bit annoying. So once you have your board set up and you're ready to introduce this into your online session, you're going to want to clarify a workflow where participants can navigate to the board, complete their activity, and then navigate back to your online seminar platform to have that group discussion. The way I do this is in my online seminar platform. This is Blackboard Collaborate, but it can be adapted for Zoom or Teams or whatever platform you're using. 
is I start by screen sharing my view of the board and I talk through how it works. So I say, this is an infinity board and when you navigate to it, you might find yourself in the middle of nowhere, but if you do, you can just zoom out to find the contents. Then I talk through whatever task I'm setting them. So if this includes putting in a picture, I'll show them how to do that. Or if it's just using post-it notes, I'll show them that you just double click on the post-it note and add your text and then move it around. Then when I'm ready for them to access the board, I go up here and click share. I make sure this setting is set to anyone with the link can edit and then I copy the board link and put it in the chat. This is one of the main reasons why you want an education license. So you can just put the link in the chat and then participants can navigate to it. You can invite people as a board member through email, but in my experience and in others' experience, this has just been a disaster because they can't create an account or they didn't receive an email. It's just so much more straightforward to give them this anonymous link. They'll join as an anonymous user. So whilst in theory, anyone can now join the board, I have only shared this link with my group. So I know who has access to it. And if somebody vandalizes the board or posts something that they shouldn't, I can probably whittle down who that might be, particularly if they're doing group work because I know who's in each group. Also, some students have fed back to me that the fact that it's anonymous means that they might actually be a little bit more willing to share ideas without the fear of looking stupid or saying the wrong thing. So once you have shared your link in the chat, you'll see participants pop up at the top here. If lots of participants are getting lost, you can use this really helpful tool, bring everyone to me which sets everybody at the same starting point. I will also set a timer. This shows up for everybody so they know how long they have to complete this task. When the timer finishes, I normally give a few extra seconds and just tell them to finish off what they're doing before I go ahead and lock the board where I change the settings so that everybody can view but not edit. Now this sometimes varies. Sometimes I'll let people continue editing as we're feeding back, but normally I'll lock the board at this stage so that the focus is on the discussion. And then I'll start a plenary style discussion about participants' contribution through a screen share. So if participants have added pictures, I'll often start by asking about those. Or if participants are working in groups, I've got this trick where I'll take a screenshot of each breakout group and have those saved to my desktop so that I know who was in each group. And then when going through each of the groups, I'll name each of the participants. So group one, that was Morgan, Charlie and Alex. Could one of you tell me a little bit about what you were talking about in your group? It's a bit of pop psychology, but it actually really works. People respond really well to their own name. It adds some accountability. And if there's a big silence, then people know it's down to Morgan, Charlie or Alex to break that silence by either turning on their mic or putting something in the chat. Then after the seminar, the nice thing is I can make these boards available to participants. I normally get the embed code to embed it into my virtual learning environment. Also, when you're setting up the board, sometimes I'll make an extra copy so that anyone accessing the content asynchronously can then complete the activity in their own time. So there you have it. That is how I use Miro to deliver 
collaborative online classes. But this platform is really powerful and allows you to be creative. And if you start using it yourself, I would love to hear about interesting and creative use cases. One example I heard is that you might be able to do like a board game style activity, which I think could be really fun. So if you've done something interesting with Miro or another collaborative whiteboard tool in teaching, then please do let me know. I would love to hear about it. So down below, I've provided some templates for you to have a look at and please, please feel free to copy or use or adapt any of these yourself. And then why not start a Miro board yourself right now? whilst it's fresh in your mind. You can get started for free, sign up for a free education account if you're eligible, and then use a virtual whiteboard in your next online teaching session.